current president takes over the leadership of the GGW, again, it will be easier for GGW to access funding from the various organizations. President Muhammad Buhari assumes presidency of the Pan-African Great Green Wall. National shall be 20 million per annum. Regional license should be 10 million per annum. Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria proposes new license fee for broadcast organizations. To go back, follow the other way to go to the back. The driver color that is the, the motor have already fallen again. Road users appeal for completion of northeastern and southeastern bypass. On Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss effective roadmap for waste management. Now, the issue of waste management has remained a critical challenge in Nigeria, and daily significant amount of waste produced ends up indiscriminately in the environment. It is estimated that Nigeria generates more than 32 million tons of solid waste annually, out of which only 20 to 30 percent is collected. Reckless disposal of municipal solid waste has led to blockage of sewers and drainage networks, also choking up water bodies. Now, most of the waste generated uh, are by households and uh, also local industries, artisans and traders who litter the immediate surroundings. Now, this has uh, informed the enunciation of policies and programs aimed at halting the ruin of the environment. Truly, the agency responsible for enforcing all environmental laws, guidelines, policies, standards and regulations in Nigeria is the National Environmental Standards and Regulations Enforcement Agency, NASRIA. It also has the responsibility to enforce compliance with provisions of international agreements, protocols, conventions, and treaties on the environment to which Nigeria is signatory. Now, the vision of the agency is to ensure a cleaner and healthier environment for Nigerians, while our mission, of course, is to inspire personal and collective responsibility in building an environmentally conscious society for the achievement of sustainable development in the country. And at the 11th National Regulatory Dialogue on the implementation of national environmental regulations two days ago in Abuja, the focus was to examine the implementation of the Extended Producer Responsibility, EPR program in Nigeria its challenges and, of course, the prospects. That's right, Nadabu. Now, the, the theme aligns with the 2016 report of the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, on greening Africa's industrialization and adoption of a circular uh, economy for sustainable development. Now, in the past, uh, of course, our parents uh, lived in much smaller communities where wastes uh, resulting from human activities were uh, dispersed over large expanse of land, resulting in little or no adverse effect on the environment. Um, uh, this is not the case now, Kisley. The exponential growth in uh, population and the subsequent expansion of industries has increased the volume and the complexities of West, uh, of West that is, which now concentrates in a few nodal points. Now, the Extended Producer Responsibility Program uh, is globally considered acceptable as an option to control waste generation. And here in Nigeria, the federal government has said it will no longer condone unsustainable disposal of waste and is putting efforts in uh, towards ensuring a global action against uh, such unsustainable disposal systems. And the Minister of State for Environment, Sharon Ikazu, at the 11th National Regulatory Dialogue, encouraged producers of products to take responsibility for the entire life cycle of their products, especially in the check back, recycling, and final destination. We should examine the workability of this and other strategies on the table 
towards tackling waste management in Nigeria. Our guests are already here and waiting for this conversation on Good Morning Nigeria today. Uh, welcome to the program. I am Yusuf Nadabo Usman. And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Nadabo to also welcome you to the program live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. As always, we'll have our complimentary segments, and these include municipal review of business and all that. So in the meantime, here is Comfort Amodu with the highlights of the morning news. Good morning, Comfort. Good morning, Kingsley, and good morning, Nadabo. Here's the morning news. A broadcasting organization of Nigeria is proposing a review of license fee for media organizations in the country pending the complete transition from analog to digital transmission. This was reached after the Central Working Committee of Bonn held a meeting in Abuja to deliberate on some of the emerging issues facing broadcast media. as broadcast license fee pending the final migration from analog to digital. National shall be 20 million per annum. Regional license should be 10 million per annum. Abuja, Lagos, Kano and Port Harcourt should be 15 million per annum. And states should be 500,000. Per annum. Uh, the federal government is committing over $11 billion for the commencement of works on the Lagos Calabar Coastal Standard Gauge Rail. Minister of Information and Culture Lai Mohammed told the press after the Federal Executive Council meeting that this is due to its importance to the nation's coastal economy. Our supporters of the opposition, People's Democratic Party, PDP, including a member board of trustees of the party, former Senator Joy M. Modi, have defected to the All Progressives Congress. And Nigeria is to assume presidency of the Pan Africa Great Green Wall as the country submits a revised nationally determined contribution to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Muhammad Buhari of Nigeria is capable of taking GGW delivery structure to a higher level if becomes the chairman of the summit of head of state and government of the GGW. That if Nigerian president takes over the leadership of the GGW again, it will be easier for GGW to access funding from the various organizations. Uh, the Federal High Court in Abuja has granted bail to the 12 associates of the self-acclaimed Yoruba nation agitated Sunday Igboho, who mounted a legal challenge to the arrest and detention by the Department of State Services, DSS, and the presiding judge, Justice Obiora Igwatu, granted bail to the applicants in Abuja. We are actually here because of their liberty, and the court has granted them their liberty. So it does not matter um, what, what are the terms of um, the bill. What's important is that they have been granted bill. And in Benue State, the police command says it will continue its onslaught against crimes and criminality in the state as it's yielding results. And they have arrested three more suspected kidnappers and rescued one kidnapped victim. Police Public Relations Officer of the Command, Sewisi Anine, while parading the suspect in Makudi, however, disclosed that one of the suspects died as a result of gunshot wounds sustained during exchange of fire with the police. And commuters flying the northeastern and southeastern road in Benue State are appealing to the contractors handling the rehabilitation work on Alede Taraku section of the road to return to site as the route has become increasingly difficult to traverse. Correspondent Ode Moses Ajawu, who visited the road, reports that commuters are also having a hard time transporting agricultural produce on the road. Everything. No, the load. Yesterday, this today morning, we finished everything. To go back, follow the other way to go to Abakliki. The driver called us that the, the motor has already fallen again. Immediately, this thing happened. Some of uh, two boys. Uh, they entered that hood there so that they would try to cover the hood. 
Remains more, this motor will kill them. We are trying to get them back to site so that they can walk and do a permanent walk. Our work is steadily progressing at the multi billion Naira Ibib region, Tarava State. Adam Haruna Adams, who was at the project site, reports that work is at the peeling stage, a strategic point in bridge construction. Miles for axis 28, 7, 6, 5, and 4. So five axes, each of them comprises six piles. We are grateful that the work is ongoing, but we pray that government will settle us to enable us to relocate. It's because of that understanding, that is why you see communities are not agitating. So they have hope that very soon the federal government will compensate. Away from that, COVID-19 in Nigeria has continued to go higher and higher with the confirmation of 747 new infections in 13 states and the FCT. In the latest figures released by the MCDC, Lagos tops the list with 488 new cases followed by Kwaibom with 121, Oyo 29, Rivers 25 and Ogun 15. The FCT and Koduna have 13 new cases each while Kwara recorded 11. Both Ekiti and Ocean State have 10 each, Edo 6, Abia 3, Anambra 2, and Plateau State 1 case. With this, Nigeria has 176,011 confirmed cases, out of which 165,288 were treated and discharged, while 2,167 died of the virus. We'll now take a break. Good morning, Nigeria. We'll continue shortly with Kinsley. And Nadabo. Many thanks. All right, that was our business package. Next for us now is newspaper review. is already in the house. Good morning, Bayo. Good morning, Yusuf. Welcome. Good morning, Kinsley. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, Bayo. Good, morning. Good to see you. So let's mm. kick off with the Punch newspaper. Right. We're fairly busy uh, front page that they have today. Above the main plate, uh, the following headlines. Twitter ban, that's the kicker. Nigerians lose 150.46 billion naira in two months. Nigerians lose 150.46 billion naira in two months. Uh, for details of that story, uh, check it out on page 19. And, well, of course, we'll be interested in how that figure was computed and how the losses yeah, uh, came about in the first instance. Is there a Twitter ban? Uh, well, that's a suspension. <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, federal government hires J.P. Morgan and others on $6.2 billion fresh borrowing. FEC approves $11 billion for Lagos Calabar Coastal Rail and $1.48 billion refineries repairs. That's for the Kaduna and Warrior Refineries. Details on page 20. 150 Nigerian doctors ready for exams ahead practicing in UK. APC governors meet in Abuja, seek soft landing for Buni and others. MDCN, that's the uh, uh, Medical uh, Dental and uh, Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria, overstepping its bounds and failing to curb quicker. That's a claim by resident doctors. Details on page 11. List stories on politics. Secondos battles for survival. In Tambowa, rally support as Wiki plots PDP chairman's removal. Two riders, Rivers governor and others want Secondos out before neck meeting and national convention. Embattled party chairman fingers on name party leader as Atiku denies involvement. And the uh, mob apprehends two suspected robbers, set them ablaze. 87 terrorists surrendered after bombardments of Sambisa, that's according to the army. Court stops DSS and AGF, AGF is Attorney General of the Federation, from uh, arresting Igboho and freezing accounts. It is on page 26. My photo with Tinubu dispels rumor about his health. That's according to Somo Olu, governor of Lagos. Youths 
protest decomposing cops on Abuja Highway, carpet FCDA. Headsmen invaded 15 villages, burnt churches, and 405 houses behind army headquarters. That's a claim by ECWA. Details on page 9. <coughs> okay, here we have uh, the Daily Trust, and then uh, the story is as follows. On the front page, we have um, just below the masthead. Uh, on page three, there's a story on fake, which marks $1.484 billion for Kaduna Wari refineries rehabilitation. And uh, on page 20, Customs seizes uh, 22 billion naira animal parts and uh, 338.58 million naira goods. Another story is federal government, why we abandoned negotiation with Bidden Apples of students. You get that details on uh, page five. The main story here is uh, the, on the PDP. It says PDP BOT Board of Trustees meets today as plot to sack second thickens. And there are four writers following this. And these are, it's conspiracy to hijack party, says him, but it's chair. And then uh, we'll overcome our challenges, said Wali Jibrin. And PDP governors meet today, that's another writer. And BOT member Imodi joins APC. Details of all this can be found on page five. At the bottom of the front page of uh, Daily Trust, we have um, ex-heads of education agencies lobby for reappointment, details on page 30. And on page four, 107 migration flani turned back from Adamawa town. And that's also a story in between there, between the photo and the last uh, uh, stories at the bottom. Uh, Buni committee has full legal backing, says APC. You can give details of that on page 36. Bio. Thank you, Yusuf. Let's start with the Federal Executive Council that rose from its meeting yesterday, approving, expanding the, and consolidating the rail progress, as well as the repair of Kaduna and Warrior refineries. Funding was approved for the work to start on the Kano, Jibia, as well as Portacourt, Maiduguri route. Approval was uh, also given for the award of the Lagos Calabar Coastal Standard Gauge Rail. The significance of that is that it will now link all coastal cities to the, to the rail line. The project is to cost $11.17 billion and will run from Lagos and terminate at Obudu Kato Ranch. Uh, along the route, it will link Shagamu to Ijebuode, Ore, Bini, Sapele, Wori, uh, and to Yenagua. From there, it will go to Potakot, Aba, Uyo, Kalaba, Akampa, Ikom, and end at Obudu. It will have a branch uh, line from Bini to link it to Asaba, Onisha Bridgehead, and then to One Seaport. Uh, it is expected that the Wari port too will be linked to the coastal rail line. The contract for the rehabilitation of the Wari <coughs> and Kaduna refinery was also awarded at a cost of 1.48 billion. Minister of State for Petroleum, Mr. Tepe Silva, explained that worry uh, overhaul will cost $897.68 million, while Kaduna refinery will cost $586.9 million. The rehabilitation will run in three phases. First phase for 21 months, second phase for 23 months, and third phase for uh, 33 months. What is not qu quite clear is whether the phases are running through for 33 months, or the first one will last 21 months, second one will start afresh for another 23 months, and the third one for another 33 months. That is, is a little bit uh, uh, confusing. However, he also indicated that Portacourt refinery that has commenced, the minister indicated that funding of 50%, 15% contract sum has already been paid. The Federal Executive Council also approved the acquisition of 20% minority stake in the Dangote refinery at a cost of about 2.76 billion whenever it comes from mainstream. Two projects were approved for the Ministry, Ministry of Education and two power substations were also approved in the Ministry of Power. Uh, meanwhile, the federal government says that it has ceased all negotiations with bandits and, and kidnappers because ransom are used to procure arms. The Minister of State for Education, Chukwe Mekan said, government is working, is 
part to rescue students as soon as possible. He says, since the military cannot go into the forest and shoot at everyone, bandits had taken advantage and are using citizens as uh, human shields. He says, as distressing as this is to everyone, the situation is of serious concern to government, and government will keep on uh, en ensuring that they continue with their initiatives to free kidnapped children, and uh, uh, they will make sure that the idea of arming the bandits by paying ransom does not continue. Meanwhile, uh, the, on the political scene, the People's Democratic Party is to hold an emergency board of trustee meeting today. The Daily Trust reports that uh, it is to address the internal wranglings uh, of the party, including calls for the resignation of the national chairman, Uche Secondos. Seven of eight deputy national officers announced their resignation on grounds of alleged poor management of the party by the embattled chairman. Board of Trustee Chairman Senator Wali Jibril says that today's meeting is to map out strategies to restore the party to the path of progress. There are speculations that the governor from the South South is the masquerade behind the threat to remove the party chairman, while another governor from the Northwest is also striving for to maintain the status quo until the convention in November 2021. Meanwhile, a member of the Board of Trustees of the People Democratic Party, Senator Joy Modi, has defected to the All Progressive Congress. On the area of uh, terror, war against terror, 87 suspected terrorists have surrendered to troops at the forward operation base in Bama, that is in Borno State. Director of Army Public Relations, Brigadier General Onyeman Wachuku, says that 19 of them are male fighters, 19 others are adult females, and 49 children all surrendered following artillery and bombardment of Sambisa Forest. Uh, the Army says that those surrenders are undergoing security profiling and investigation. The children, however, have been uh, given oral polio vaccination to continue to protect them. Well, that is how the, the outlook is like. And uh, Yes, we have um, the editorial here, know, is talking about the prepared meters, saying, despite the problem, the federal government must ensure success of the NM. MP. Well, it is, <laughs> you remember there is this uh, national mass metering program, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. part of it was that there was going to be prepaid meters to the corner of about six million that will be provided over a phase period. And the editorial is drawing attention that in the first phase for a week period of time, which was to end in April this year, and at that time, one million meters were supposed to have been provided, but up to date, only about uh, 656,752 of them, of the 1 million meters, have been provided. So that is becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. It was, the expectations were high that what has been described by uh, public consumers as crazy estimated bills that were coming from uh, the distribution companies, uh, and from the, yes, uh, power companies, will be eliminated when the peter meter is there, you will now get to pay exactly what you have consumed. But even though some of the prepaid meters that has long been issued, you now find officials going from house to house telling you that the meter is malfunctioning and they are now adjusting the meter so that uh, it can give you adequate uh, reckoning. Mm -hmm. So you find that, that sometimes when they come, they say, well, the meter is not reading well. It is not your fault. But now we found out that uh, you, you have an arrears of, say, about 48,000 or something that you have to pay and they now have to spread it over several months. So co consequently, when you go now and you want to buy credit for 5,000, you'll be given only for about 3,000 and 2,000 is taking care of the areas. So there are a lot of uh, complications going on there and members of the public are actually getting the hard end of the <coughs> seat. There are much more really because I know I remember Kingsley we had a program here on this uh, NMMP uh, national mass uh, meter, meter program. And then um, the issues at stake were then that um, even with that largesse, with that, you know, magnanimity by the federal government, still there are some shady practices taking place uh, within the discourse, within the consumers, and all over in the Nigerian society. And then uh, that might have in some way or some kind of way, you know, halted the implementation, full implementation of it. Because by now, as you said, we're supposed to have at least gone a hundred or rather one million 
you know, meters, you know, by being April of this year. By April, they yeah. They even extended to June, or, but still, they've mm. still you know, been able not to meet it. Not that. to meet it. But the questions may be that maybe there are some issues with manufacturing or whatever. I don't know. Kingsley, what do you say about it? Well, uh, I, I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> the mass metering program was intended uh, to provide relief for consumers who had been complaining yeah. about uh, estimated billing and other uh, underhand practices by a number of the discos operating in the country. Now, is the mass metering program going on well? Uh, about a million or more meters were lined up for distribution at no cost to, uh, to consumers. Now, if, as Maya has indicated, uh, some of the uh, operatives of uh, discos are going around to say, oh, sorry, your meter wasn't uh, properly configured. Whose business are these not uh, uh, factory preset uh, meters that ordinarily should have been configured at the time of production? You are now coming around to come and be resetting the meters and you are shortchanging people. Ultimately, I mean, this is just a challenge with uh, consumer protection in Nigeria. Mm. Ultimately, that's, that's what it is. Mm. I mean, you're just taking consumers for granted and uh, so it's a supplier's market and then you you act and behave any, any way you like and, uh, and you get away with it. Uh, it's, it's one of the terrible things that we have seen with uh, an aspect of privatization, that's to say uh, of, of, the, of the power sector. A lot of the old habits of, uh, of the legacy uh, institution, whether it was PACN or NEPA, those habits have been carried over to, uh, uh, to the discos uh, in, in particular. And this was a challenge because in terms of disengagement or reabsorption or pension or handling the labor issues around, around the, the privatization, you know, labor was very vociferous. But I asked the question, and I'm sure a number of persons also have asked the question, where is labor today? Where do you hear that workers of this coast are going around shortchanging consumers? <laughs> like you I said, old habits die hard from the advent of ECN up to uh, uh, PACN, the same practices are, are, are being perpetuated. Sadly too, in spite of the announcement that the, the prepaid, uh, the meters that were going to be distributed were going to be free, you hear that until there were no meters now, when you have to get a single phase meter, you had to cough out about 57,000. And a three phase meter was going to about, for about 50 something thousand. No, the question is really why are there no meters? And given the fact that to April this year, we are supposed, or rather the government is supposed to have, you know, dished out, um, you know, uh, one million uh, pieces of uh, meters to Nigerians for free before we go into the second phase. That's the big question. That's if we'll be able to meet that, the most likely we'll see we're on course. But for who, now, who, I think we're not really on course. Who is handling uh, it? Uh, why have there mm. been delays? Mm. Who is monitoring it? Mm. And what, what are the sanctions for delays or for the mismanagement of of, uh, of the meter distribution uh, mm. program. These are the issues. I, I believe yeah, I think these are great issues, really, and this yeah, could be another... Yeah, manufacturing this companies in Nigeria. This there's could be... There's one in Zaria. I think mm. there's one somewhere in... Uh, I can't remember already now. There's some mm. export processing zone, I believe, yes. in Calabar. Calabar, yes. yes. You know, so... Yeah, we're just giving be, excuses. Really. It's, uh, and then you, you, you create artificial scarcity, people mm. rolling around, and it's, uh, it's, it's an ordeal. It's an ordeal. But I, I tell you, uh, that's the editorial. I'm just not about just before free, we leave. Yeah. Yeah, just before we leave, because this is something that has been recurring. It, the stories get published, and then we, uh, we gloss over the stories. Mm. Punch, 150 uh, Nigerian doctors ready for exams ahead practicing in the UK. This is just another indication of further brain drain. Uh, as of June this year, according to the report, well over 8,000 Nigerian medical doctors are said to be practicing in the UK. 8,000, and you have 150. You, c you can imagine if you had 150 extra medical doctors, say in the Federal Capital Territory, say in Kaduna State, say in Adamawa State, say in Edo State. But you know, we just allow people to go to say, oh no, the, the, the circumstance is not right, you know, let them, let them, let them go, they will earn more money, and, and so on and so forth. But the quality of our healthcare system continues to deteriorate. Uh, we, we must at some point get up and say, look, what are those factors? How do we know them? And how do we begin to fix those factors mm -hmm. responsible for brain drain? It's very sad. That's really but, sad. But there really is a sad. silver lining to this. Mm -hmm. In spite of the challenges we have here, our medical personnel, doctors and nurses, are in very high demand. 
This is because of the nature of the kind of education we get in Nigeria. But be that as it may, another part of the story that has not been told is the fact that there was an alarm raised within the circles of the Nigeria Medical Association that many of these people who sit these exams and go abroad eventually regret because the, the circumstances, are, the pastors there are not as green as they think it is. Well, only when you go out, then you see it. But yes, it stares well, you in uh, the uh, face. Uh, and, uh, well, but uh, how many of them are returning? No, no. If the pastors, if the pastors the are brown, the green. The percentage of those returns will be very, very negligible. Yes, I mean, let's, 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 let's be realistic about That's it. just the way it is. <laughs> and uh, you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. Bayo, thank you so much for thank being you part too. of uh, this program today. Tomorrow is going to be another day. Huh? Join us after the break, please. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria, and we're reaching you from the Nigerian Intelligence Authority this very morning. We're discussing roadmap to effective waste management, and uh, our discussion uh, will be kick-started by this, uh, you know, uh, background report put together by Joseph Watson. <laughs> Environmental experts are in agreement that solid waste generation has consistently expanded both in volumes and complexity due to the rapid increase in population over the years, social economic development, industrialization, and changing lifestyles. Nigeria is said to be one of the biggest contributors of solid waste in Africa, generating more than 32 million tons annually from households local industries, artisans, and marketplaces, indiscriminate dumping of waste in urban places, drainage channels, streams, and rivers have led to littering of the environment, blockage of water channels, and creating breeding grounds for diseases. Nigeria is presently battling with the outbreak of cholera in some parts of the country, a disease connected to unhealthy environment. Decomposing and burning waste also release pollutants in the air, water, and soil which experts link to respiratory problems, eye infection, and lower life expectancy. Meanwhile, many of the flooding witnessed in urban areas are associated to block drainage channels. The West Burden is demanding better management system in Nigeria, as it is in other countries where West has become source of wealth. For instance, solid waste has been converted for renewable energy in electricity and gas production. To explore this initiative, the Federal Executive Council in 2020 approved a solid waste management policy. But is this making any headway? What is hindering development of infrastructure for sustainable waste management for wealth creation in Nigeria? Guests on Good Morning Nigeria will be looking into the issues and provide a roadmap to effective waste management. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joseph Olsen, for that background. I'm uh, with us in the studios now to discuss the issues. Let's welcome the Director General of the National Environmental Standards and uh, Regula Regula Regulations Enforcement Agency. That's the National Environmental Standards and Regulations Enforcement Agency, NESRIA, Professor Aliu Jaro. Uh, Prof, I'd like to have you with us on the program this morning. Good morning. Also here with us, uh, in the uh, Abuja studios is the uh, former general manager of the Kaduna State Environmental Protection Authority, uh, Dr. Abdullahi Rigasa. Dr. Rigasa, I'd like to have you this morning. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, still joining us uh, in the studio here in Abuja is uh, the chief executive, uh, you know, Alliance uh, for Responsible Battery Recycling, Tess uh, Ugbo. Good to have you on Good Morning Nigeria. I think I pronounced the name right. Yeah, we try to do that. You're welcome. And also joining us from our Lagos studio is Ibukun Falue, uh, the Executive Secretary of uh, EUS Producers Responsibility Organization of Nigeria. Welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Let's begin with the uh, DG of Nigeria, Professor uh, Aleo Jaro. We know, of course, that uh, th there are relevant issues relating to uh, waste uh, management in the country. E-waste have become more prominent uh, in, in recent years. Medical waste is also there. But in general, I, I mean, the menace that uh, we all face daily has to do with solid waste management, most especially in our urban areas and also along highways. 
uh, where wastes are dumped uh, indiscriminately. What has been the major issue in combating uh, waste in, in Nigeria? Well, uh, waste generation has been a problem for a very long time due to the population of Nigeria. The current projection of 32 million tons being generated annually is not even, uh, it's just an estimate. I think it's more than that. It should be over 50 million tons that is uh, generated. So one of the major challenges is the disposal of, indiscriminate disposal of this waste, especially domestic waste. People just dump it the way they like. They don't follow the stipulated way. Right from home, if it's a domestic waste, it's supposed to provide re different receptacles. You do the segregation. So this recyclable, recyclable should be collected in separate receptacles so that the waste collectors can collect and take it to the recycling uh, plant. So one of the major challenges presently, the sector is not well developed for the recycling of uh, this uh, domestic waste. So people just tend to dump it the way they like. And secondly, people are not well sensitized, they are not well educated on the need for them to do the needful. Because when we continue to litter and dump it, it's going to be a major problem. It's already a problem. Annually, when it's rainy season, this waste will clog the drainages. This is one of the major contributors to flooding that we experience all over the country. Secondly, the finance. We don't have the financial uh, muscle to finance the process of uh, the waste collection and the recycling. And thirdly, the machineries that are needed to recycle this waste are not uh, forthcoming. They are very expensive. They have uh, we have to import them. So all these come together to compound the the problem. But the only solution is uh, we sh should all sit down to look at what we should do with this waste. Most of these wastes they have a lot of uh, valuables. I know we are coming to that. So these are some of the challenges. People are not ready to comply with also the environmental regulations. But this may not be unconnected, Prof, from, uh, you know, the, if, uh, if one would really use the word hangover from the past, when people don't really care much about West, it is West negative. There's nothing positive about it. And people now just throw it and throw it away, not even dumping per se, but just throw away and then you know, it becomes uh, this. Thing. So, but uh, generally, Nigeria's population grew, you know, many folds over the years. And of course, we are now hitting over 200 million. Uh, unlike before, when waste could be just found and then be taken away by anybody else, or water just takes away and whatever. Now, as you said, it's over 50 million tons annually. This really worrisome. I don't know how so worrisome this can be to Nashville. It's uh, highly worrisome to us. Even though we have the regulatory framework to check it, for instance, we have uh, national regulations on uh, sanitation and waste control, which is put in place to check the issue of uh, this waste, especially solid. It's not only solid waste, we also have the liquid waste. So there's a regulatory framework. And apart from that, we have nine other regulations that are in the brown environment that is the manufacturing sector. Okay. You know, it's another major sector that generates a lot of waste. So each of this uh, sector, there is provision for extended producer responsibility. Whoever generates the waste should make, make provision for how to take care of this waste. For instance, if you talk about electronic waste, we have a regulation on the electrical electronic sector. And in that regulation, we have the provision for the extended producer responsibility. And this extended producer responsibility is put in place so that at the end of life of any electrical equipment, for instance, the manufacturer or the importer or the franchise of that item is saddled with the responsibility of taking it out of the uh, environment and recycling <coughs> it in order to get the valuables out of it. So at the end of the day, what we intend to achieve is circular economy, circularity. Mm -hmm. 
instead of use and dump, after usage, you collect it and you recycle it. So when we do that, we are going to reduce the burden of waste that we dump in the environment so that at the end maybe you get just a fraction of what is unwanted. Likewise, other sectors like food and beverages, we have uh, that provision. We have a uh, provision in the textile sector, about uh, nine different sectors. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this EPR will go a long way in uh, addressing this problem, even though we are just uh, starting. But so far now, we are able to uh, form the producer as a field organization for our three sectors. For the electronic waste, we are able to encourage the manufacturers, they come together and they have registered their PRO, which we call the uh, EOS Producer Respiratory Organization of Nigeria. So it's a third party that manages all electronic waste on behalf of the manufacturers. You, you, so you, you know, Prof, uh, uh, DG, I know the, you, uh, the question that my colleague was asking. Before we get into the area of extended producer responsibility, I mean, you're not going to ask farmers, for instance, to come and have responsibility for the waste that uh, is left after they have eaten the food that they have produced. So household waste that we're talking about, you're talking about EPR will relate generally to more of industrial waste and so on and so forth. Since we are still dealing with the issue around you know, domestic uh, or household yes. waste, let's deal with that. They will come back again to this one, which is also critical because population is increasing, electronic waste is also uh, getting more and more. Dr. Regassa, mm -hmm. look, for how long or how validly can we blame our population growth for our inability to properly manage solid waste in our environment? 30, 40 years ago mm. in Nigeria, mm. it was not uncommon for persons who were giving directions to where you were going in certain urban locations, they would mm. tell you, when you get to that refuse dump, go left. Mm. You go there, you see another small refuse dump, you mm. go right or somewhere. Mm. I'm sure you are familiar with this. Yes. Yeah. No, 40 years later, we are still having basically the same scenario in most of urban Nigeria. What challenge do we have in just uh, in dealing with our solid waste? Yeah, I think over the years, uh, there has been some um, uh, weaknesses in our attempt to transform our waste management capacity to the level that we see in developing countries. And what happened? Clearly people knew that in those days, waste management, especially in communities, were taken care of by local governments. But over the years, waste management in most cities has been taken over by, by the states. And waste management in communities, especially when it comes to domestic waste, is better carried out by local governments. But now local governments don't have the funds and uh, you know, the technical capacity to actually move from house to house and manage those waste. Just yesterday, if you remember, I saw it in the news, the governor of uh, Lagos State yeah. has invested heavily in terms of uh, equipment and other materials to lobber. And constitutionally, the management of you know, household waste you know, has been handled by local governments. How, uh, if you look at even the setup today, you didn't invite the sanitarians people who move from house to house, you know, to educate, to inspect, and also, uh, you know, enforce, you know, public health rules and regulation at domestic level. But states that have taken over this function of local government are not the best, you know, to actually discharge this responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nesra is taking the lead, but uh, Nesra cannot go into house to house, mm -hmm. you know, to actually enforce, you know, what I call uh, waste management responsibility on individual citizens. This is a duty of local government and we need to ensure that we empower them appropriately so that they can actually carry out their function. And then Nestle at the top of the pyramid can now look you know, at every other stakeholder and say, okay, this is the way the nation is supposed to go. That capacity is something that we have lost. And as long as we fail to recognize you know, the, the capacity of citizens and communities to transform themselves in waste management uh, will continue to be lost. You are, uh, you know, one I could say as a protector of the environment yeah. because you've been former general manager, rather you are former general manager of the National Environmental Protection Agency or Authority. Yeah. What do you think or what's in your opinion 
uh, could be, you know, public, the reason for public negligence of uh, West and then uh, having to now say that uh, people have to be very much aware about West. It's a West. You throw it into the gutter in front of your house, it becomes a problem to you because when floods come, it enters your house, not anybody's house. And there we go. Every year, uh, every time we keep talking about this. I know when you're in Kaduna in that seat, you've been having enlightenments every time in this season, for instance, and the rest of them. Mm. People have not been heeding so much. What do you think is the reason? Uh, our educational system, you see, uh, if you look at it right from primary school, they teach you how you brush your mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, but the waste management behavior that we need to inculcate in the younger ones, if you look at the curricula, right from nursery school, from primary school, fr you know, secondary school, universities, these environmental responsibilities are missing in our educational curricula. We need to go back to that. If you move to developed countries, for example, in Japan, uh, kids in secondary uh, in uh, kindergarten, you know, nursery school, primary schools, they they used to educate them in how to clean their classes and to clean their houses. If you see your dad or your mom cleaning the house every morning, certainly you will imbibe that uh, that culture. But this, you know, educational tools at home and in schools are critically missing, and that is why now you have adults, adults that are not, you know, aware of their environmental responsibilities. And when you go for enforcement, it becomes very difficult because these are values that is alien, you know. Uh, it's, it's beginning to look more like uh, something strange when you are asking adults, you know, to sanitize their environment. And it shouldn't be so. This should be something that is, you know, we internalize as part of our own way of life. Is it a fallout from the earlier, you know, in the, in the 50s, 60s, and even 70s? Mm -hmm. There are... You know, officials we call Duvagari, yes. you know, in house, yes, yes, yes. are those checking the environmental, mm -hmm. you know, sanitary, I mean, sanitation officers and hygiene officers, yes. I would say. Mm -hmm. And these are people that go into house, from house to house, talking to you about your environment and how you should keep it clean. Mm -hmm. These are missing now. Is it out of that or how do you mean? Yes, the reason why they are missing, as I mentioned earlier, is because states have taken over the environmental responsibilities of local government and states are not able to function as local government when it comes to this particular aspect of our national life. So we need to go back, ensure that the constitutional responsibilities of local government, especially in waste management and sanitation, has, give, has been given to, to the local government. And not only given to them, we need to empower them financially uh, and otherwise for them to be able to discharge this responsibility. But as long as you know, we ignore this aspect of our constitutional duties, no, uh, we'll continue to, uh, we'll not be able to get it right. Uh, Dr. Ridasa, thank you very much. I mean, what, uh, yes. what, what we're looking at here again is uh, the emasculation of, of local governments mm. uh, in Nigeria. Mm. Because clearly, the fourth schedule to the Constitution stipulates the functions of local governments, mm. of which waste management, of course, is one of them. Mm. Uh, a number of states have uh, enacted through, uh, through their Houses of Assembly uh, state laws uh, usurping the functions of, of, of local governments and then local governments of course uh, just uh, uh, sit by and then watch as uh, the state uh, uh, proceeds. Let's bring in uh, Tessa Ugo here uh, who is uh, of the Alliance for Responsible Battery uh, Recycling. We, we know again uh, batteries have become uh, a plenty either for electronic use or for vehicular use, generators, and, and, and all kinds of things. And the, the effective management or efficient management of wastes arising from, from batteries is a critical one. How well is your alliance proceeding with this? And what are the challenges? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, batteries have become an essential part of our daily lives. You know, as you mentioned, uh, mobile phones, laptops, um, our automobiles, uh, renewable energy systems, uh, inverters. As you know, everybody, uh, most organizations have inverters in their offices, and many people are installing um, inverters at home now that need energy storage, which requires a lot of batteries. So batteries have become an essential aspect of our daily lives. So there's need to come up with the framework on how these batteries, when they get to end of life, how they should be managed. And um, Nezra came up with the idea of the extended producer responsibility, which requires that batteries uh, companies and individuals who benefit from batteries, who, are, who, 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 who 
who import or manufacture batteries in Nigeria must take some responsibility in how these batteries are collected, transported, stored, and recycled at the end of life. So it's an alliance. Uh, two years ago, uh, the Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria, uh, the Waste Battery Recyclers Association of Nigeria, uh, the Recycling and Economic Development Initiative of Nigeria, Reading, along with the Battery Importers Dealers Association, and a few other uh, consultants in the environmental space formed the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling, which I am privileged to lead right now. Um, our responsibility really is to help to coordinate these national efforts to get uh, everybody who is involved in batteries to play the role of ex ensuring proper collection, proper disposal, and then, of course, clean recycling uh, of batteries in the smelting plants because this is a major, major um, pollutant. Batteries contain lead, contain acids and, uh, and other chemicals that if not properly disposed of or if disposed of in the environment can cause serious harm and serious damage to our environment and of course to human health. The human health aspects of battery pollution is really great because it's kidney disease, diseases, liver diseases, uh, it affects children's IQ, it affects, our, uh, it affects so many, it affects women's reproductive health, you know, when, you know, when you get lead or acid into your bloodstream. And so we've been doing a lot of work to sensitize the public. We've also been working with battery collectors and battery recyclers across the country um, to ensure that the facilities where they're collecting, storing, and recycling these batteries are not around um, communities, residential communities, where people can have um, easy access and where the emissions and the acid disposal and things like that in the community are not affected, uh, you know, citizens in these communities are not affected. So we've been working closely with um, battery recyclers, trying to upgrade their facilities, try to get them to modernize um, facilities to state-of-the-art uh, levels that are acceptable globally. As you know, Nigeria is a signatory to the Basel uh, Convention that has set guidelines on how um, used batteries should be managed in countries that are signatories, and Nigeria is a signatory. So we've been working with this and then working with Nigeria, of course, on, on, on regulations and policies uh, from the Ministry of Environment also to see how we can put in place proper frameworks and proper rules and uh, guidelines on how um, batteries should be managed in Nigeria across all sectors that, um, that use batteries, especially from the automotive sector, which is the highest um, consumer and generator of batteries, especially Nigeria is going towards um, electronic vehicles. The National Automotive Council has been working hard to introduce uh, electronic vehicles in Nigeria. This means we're moving more and more towards reliance on batteries because even the charging stations where these ev uh, electronic vehicles will be charged will be powered by uh, solar, which also requires uh, batteries. So there's a huge need for uh, more awareness and more regulation uh, when it has to do with uh, used battery management in Nigeria. Oh, thank you so much, Atessa. But um, batteries generally are now, or rather have now not been so much of a problem as far as waste are concerned because you hardly can find batteries now as being thrown away or whatever. Once it is dead, you went for, I mean, when you go for a new one, of course, they'll ask you where's the old one. So you just do what the house someone called Kakara, that's the buy it a little bit for some money and then you make the balance for the new one. We shall come back to that later, talking about recycling. But uh, Prof, let's, um, now he said, you, they came into being just about two years ago and you earlier mentioned that um, uh, some of these associations are coming up. Um, let's have an overview of uh, the associations that really have come under your, you know, your, your, your agency and then see which and which are really, uh, which of them really, uh, or which of these associations require some sort of uh, enlightenment or education so that the public could know that this is in the offing and which ones are really required in order to get things moving for you because you need them? Uh, well, so far, uh, the model adopted in Nigeria is the pro producer responsibility organization model, that is the PRO, is the most widely used model in the whole of the uh, world. So uh, in this model, the industries, that is the manufacturers, come together to form the PRO, which is a third party that manages the waste being generated on behalf of uh, the manufacturers. So, so far now we have uh, the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling, which has been uh, managed by Tessie, mm -hmm. who just uh, finished uh, speaking. So they deal with uh, waste batteries, as mentioned. 
And we also have uh, the second one, which uh, has to do with uh, the food and beverages. We call it uh, Alliance for Responsible. Uh, the, for the battery is Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling. Mm. And we have those that manages waste that are coming from the food and beverages sector, mm -hmm. which generates the bulk of the waste when we talk about food. The packaging, the plastic waste come from them. So those one we call them fibra. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the food. Uh, res uh, fibra is responsible for the collection of all the waste, and they are the PRO for the food and beverage sector. And we have uh, also the third one. So we have battery. We have uh, that of the food, food sector. Beverage. Fibra. Yeah, we have the electronic waste. Mm -hmm. So the PRO for the electronic waste is called EPRON, that is E-Waste Producer Responsibility Organization of Nigeria. So currently... You don't have for medical? We don't have for medical. Medical waste, all those syringes and, you know, and all kinds of uh, deadly things that yes. you know, people just discard anyhow. We have others that are coming on stream. Mm -hmm. Presently, even yesterday, we had a discussion with some people for waste tires, you know, tire is also a major problem mm -hmm. and it can be recycled. So they are trying to also form their PRO. Mm -hmm. We also have the metallic sector. So they are also coming on board. Mm -hmm. You know, we have all sort of this waste being recycled, but informally. Mm -hmm. So likewise, as you have mentioned for the e-waste. E-waste is also another problem. And uh, just last week, we just gazetted a regulation on E-West. So in that oh. regulation, we also have provision for EPR. Uh, okay. So it I believe in future, they're also going to come on board. It, you know, Prof, uh, there's Ibukun uh, Faluye, whom we earlier introduced. Uh, she's of the E-Waste Producers Responsibility Organization of Nigeria. Uh, she's joining us via Zoom from, uh, from Lagos. Uh, Ms. Ibukun uh, Faluye, thank you very much. I'm sure you've been listening to the other three guests here with us in, in the studios. It's uh, been an interesting conversation. Uh, all right. Well, you're part of the conversation, and uh, so we're coming to you right now. Uh, tell us, are we up to scratch yet in beginning to deal with uh, e-waste in Nigeria? Yes. So I, the e-waste producer responsibility organization, um, I'm not very sure I got your question. If you can come all right. again. Let me, let me, uh, I, I asked, are we up to scratch? in beginning to deal with e-waste. In other words, where are we in uh, managing e-waste in Nigeria? Are we just still at the okay. rudimentary level or we are on top of it? Okay, so um, thank you for the question. Um, at this point, a lot of e-waste management in Nigeria is still in the informal sector, but um, we, are, we are at the point where we are putting appropriate structures in place to transition from that informal arrangement to a very formal arrangement, which will work and is extremely sustainable. And what EPRON has done is um, we've brought, as an organization that is uh, led completely by producers, some a group of producers um, like MTN, HP, SPL, Solar, um, Energy Solar, and the likes of them have come together to form this organization to ensure that all electrical and electronic equipment that reach end of life in Nigeria will be responsibly managed. So we've also formed a very good governance system that will ensure that we, we really close the loop because we know that when it comes to e-waste in Nigeria, we have a lot, um, majority of us here look, do not manufacture, we import it. So we've had to bring in an advisory council that has some level of control at the borders in terms of the Nigerian customs is in the advisory council. The standard organization of Nigeria is on the advisory council as well. Why do we have these organizations on the advisory council? Because we want a situation where the approach to managing e um, end of life electrical and electronic equipment is um, very holistic and then nobody is left out. We don't have free riders and everybody eventually joins. So right now we have about 47 members on board. Um, the four members that started in 2018 when we were incorporated as a PRO. We have about 47 registered organizations with us. And we're already setting up the framework in terms of um, billing the levies and then registering the recyclers and the collectors. 
with the support of the Jeff project that um, Nezra got, we, we, we have arrangements to have like 30 collection centers so that people can take back their end of life electrical and electronic equipment and we completely divert them away from the informal sector where they, they are and then bring it to the formal um, environmentally sound recycling arrangement. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boko, follow you. Well, fine. I mean, you've uh, outlined the governance framework that is uh, developing around e-waste management. But in terms of citizen engagement, citizen responsibility, or user engagement and user responsibility, w what is responsible e-waste management? That's the end of life management of uh, a piece of electrical or electronic uh, gadget so that the ordinary citizen would know whether I can just throw this one into a dustbin or take it to some collection point. What is the protocol? Okay. So uh, essentially, um, as we are setting up the collection system is to enable people have a place or you know people that will be responsible for collecting these things from them. Because it's the current practice is to throw them into the regular bins alongside other municipal solid waste which is very wrong because of the hazardous nature of electronic waste. It shouldn't be in the municipal waste at all. And it shouldn't end up at the dump sites or at the landfill. So the arrangement is to have those collection centers, people keep their electronic waste and then take it to the collection centers or give it to registered informal collectors that will take it to the collection centers. And from the collection centers, they're transferred to the recyclers who will recycle them in an environmentally sound manner. So we've started some level of awareness, but you know, there's still a lot more that we need to do because as we're raising awareness, we're seeing that the knowledge gap is really wide. And so we're using a lot of different avenues to raise awareness, especially, you know, the social media a lot of the times. And then uh, as, as time goes on, when the system is fully in place and we have the collection center set, we'll deploy all kinds of media to let, let people be fully aware of their own individual responsibility and consumer obligations towards electronic waste. Still, still, let's hang a while before we let you go for a while. Let's look at this uh, electronic waste and, of course, the electrical waste, if added to that, actually, because that should be under your own association, I think, electrical and uh, electronic waste. And um, looking at these two sections or sectors of the waste management system, um, one cannot really run away from the fact that it's really huge what you have on the table. Um, and that is simply because more than 70 to 80 percent of Nigerians use these uh, items and then if not electronic, I mean electrical and sometimes both, which means churning out a lot more of the waste every now and then. You have over 500,000 tons uh, being churned out mm -hmm. virtually almost uh, every month. Now, this is really a great deal and of course a big challenge. Now you're getting started, you are, uh, you are now moving on. I don't know how far you've gone in trying to reach out now to uh, uh, most Nigerians in this regard, because it's all about telling them that the West, your, your old hand, I mean handset, and your, you know, uh, you know, spoiled, uh, you know, uh, recharger and things like that are really important. Bring it here or take it there. Okay, so um, I didn't get that question clearly, but I'm assuming you're asking how do we intend to, uh, please, if you can come again, it'll be, it'll be very helpful. Uh, simply put, how do we educate Nigerians, given the fact that most Nigerians use either electronic or electrical, you know, appliances, which means a lot, a lot of Nigerians, you know, churn out this waste every now and then. We said over 500,000 of it, I mean, tons of that is of it, uh, uh, coming out monthly out of uh, Nigerians. Now, how do you educate Nigerians that your used or dead handset, if uh, put banally, and then your dead, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, adapter, for instance, or radio set, uh, could be taken to this or that place? It's important instead of throwing you away somewhere. Yeah. So, um, like I, I, I agree with you that it's a very important um, issue in terms of um, educating people because of the volume, especially, that is generated. If we look in our typical houses around us at all times, the number of electronic equipment we will have is not less than 10 because you have your lighting, you have your televisions, you have your refrigerators, you know, different categories of electronic waste, which are quite wide. 
So one, one of the things that we're putting in place is um, an incentive-based system where people will be incentivized for whatever e-waste they have kept and put, put through formal collection channels so that there's, uh, you know, an attraction and, you know, a willingness to want to give back this e-waste for recycling. Like I mentioned earlier, we are deploying um, different kinds of communication uh, methods, social media, and then as we move along and we have the collection centers, we'll also be deploying um, what, um, what's it called, um, all other kinds of media. But we also do a lot of uh, like school awareness. Last year, we had a very good um, awareness program that we did across schools in six geopolitical zones of Nigeria, where we had the debate and helped children to see that electronic waste is something that needs to be keep off and kept, you know, for uh, for, for circularity, for re for recycling purposes. So that was a, a very good one that you know really worked and got a lot of people um, to have awareness. But we're also doing something we call like industry engagements, which we're planning with Nezra now, starting with the banking sector, the renewable energy sector, all the different sectors that generate a huge amount of um, electronic waste. And then in terms of even when we are going to go full scale for you know massive campaigns that we're going to develop for for educating people, we intend to you know translate into local languages so that all people can understand what we're trying to you know let them know about electronic waste and how they should handle it at the end of life. And then you know when you look at our approach, what we are, we are promoting is circularity and a circular economy. So it's um, it's not just uh, the end of life uh, management, but we're also talking to people about how to reduce what we generate. You know, a, a lot of us are, you know, upwardly mobile, we want the latest gadgets, we want to reduce what we generate at that level. And then when things are spoiled, we can look at the option of repair rather than just go and buy a new one so that we do not generate. So we are, we are going full circularity, looking at how to be more circular in our approach as individuals and as organizations. So also buy products that last longer rather than, you know, products that we use for a short while and then it's, it's already obsolete. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bukun Faluye, for uh, your comments. I'm sorry if you were in Lagos uh, in the uh, early to the mid-80s, you would have heard the jingle on uh, FRC2 at the time. It was in Pigeon. Uh, it had to do with uh, why. You said, no, throw away dirty anyhow. Nanyama, nyama, you be take play or something. I'm sure if you recall that in, uh, in, in Lagos. But the question is going to Dr. Rigasa now. Well... Uh, it's, it will not be appropriate to, to ask whether we are going to now seek to bite more than we can chew. Mm -hmm. Because we have the single track of m not efficiently and effectively managing solid waste. Mm -hmm. And here we are now, we have e-waste, other which you can bring in batteries, you bring in electrical, electrical, medical, other forms of waste that, that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Are we... Are we up to scratch just yet, the question I asked earlier, in seeking to enlighten our people as to how to handle your, uh, your e-waste, whether it's a telephone that you are no longer using, or you have changed the battery from uh, those who have helped you change the battery, or your television said that it's no longer working, you have bought a, a flat screen or a curved one if you have the money. I don't know how much it is now, but mm -hmm. are, are we up to scratch yet in just sensitizing our people? or? Uh, I don't know. What, what do you think? So we are not up to scratch, as you are. If that is the answer that uh, you may <laughs> so want. So what do we need to, to do? <laughs> yes, what we need to do is that we need to recognize that everybody has a role to play in the waste management. And that has not sink in yet, you know, across, you know, the big stakeholders uh, in the management framework. And um, just as you ask that, you see, what the federal government is doing, what Nestle has done is, you know, very beautiful and uh, it's very critical that we move from a linear waste management system to the circular uh, framework. But in our attempt to move to the circular level, even the linear one, we have not gotten it right. This is a country of over 200 million people and yet we don't have a land, a sanitary landfill. Abuja is the only city with, with a sewer. And when you go to our primary and secondary schools, you ask them, what, is, what are the solid waste value chains you know, in your city, in Abuja? What do we generate more than any other you know, uh, value chain of waste? We don't know. 
But every morning, if you look at your the dustbin in front of your house, you see waste pickers, you know, going there, peeping and picking things. They visit the bin over 10 times. Mm -hmm. At their level, they are competent, they are highly educated, and they know what to do because they are, they are making money out of it. But then when you move up to the government level, you see this attempt. We are trying to make money from solid waste, you know, and we are trying to absorb ourselves from um, what I say, what, what I can call duty of care, because what we need f is performance rather than commercialization. Like uh, if you look at Kano, if you look at uh, Kaduna, and some other states, they've not even waken up to their environmental responsibility. But when you look at Kano, Kaduna, and Lagos, where this solid waste challenge is actually on the ground, you see the government you know, actually trying to do something. But even in those places, uh, the view at the level of governance is that, look, this is a business. We can make money out of it. Solid waste management, yes, we can make money, but it's not a business. Just like when you look at, you know, other social aspects of our life, education, defense, uh, you know, things like that. Waste management, yes, it can be made profitable, but at this level where we are, we need to ensure that we have a functional system that, you know, deliver the services at the quality level that actually we desire. But if we focus on the attempt to make money, make money, that is the reason why government of Lagos is, you know, bought this stuff and give them to Loma. Where is the money coming from? It's coming from tax payers. So government must invest in knowledge, in technology, you know, and otherwise, and in infrastructure. There is no reason why Nigeria at this level, 60 years after independence, we don't have a sanitary landfill. Every day we are taking off collection, transportation, and waste disposal. Uh, so what have we been doing, you know, across these 60 years? It's not good for people like us uh, in the game, that they will say, okay, the only landfill you see in Africa is either in Egypt or South Africa. The sub-Saharan Africa has certainly been failing in the area of solid waste management. And the simple reason is that we have the institutions, and some of them, they, we have the laws, but they are working in silos. The problem in waste management, as I've always said in this country, is never money. It's not money, but we are not working working together. Yes, the guidelines is there. So state government must be able to, you know, draw, learn, you know, from the guidelines. And these li guidelines must go down to local government, to communities and citizens. Yes, we are talking about e-waste. If I have a TV, just as you say, and somebody is knocking on my door, look, if you have, and you know, a TV that has reached the end of life, I want to buy it. Why should I take it to, <laughs> to third party? When somebody is already in my house, he wants to buy it, and certainly he will pay more than their own collection center. So, that, so people need to be educated and properly incentivized. And there has to be, you know, Nestle has to look at from the top of the pyramid. It has to ensure that this knowledge and regulation actually reach the grassroots. Otherwise, you know, when we leave the leakages, no, we are not going to get the quality of service that we need. Oh, well, Rugasa, thank you very much for that, really. I mean, uh, Nesua is here. Yeah, uh, he heard you. <laughs> and, of course, the challenge is now to you. As he said, every morning, for instance, in our locality surround, especially in our area, sub suburban areas, right, you hear this noise outside and people calling and asking, mm -hmm. any dirt, any used battery, any used TV, any, so many of them. Mm -hmm. And then, as in addition to that, there are so many of these you know, self-employed guys that go around those beans with their magnets mm -hmm. and, of course, with their sticks and their irons and whatever, picking them all around the day, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this is a challenge to you. West to wealth, and that is why we're headed. Roadmap to effective waste management you recently launched. I mean, talked about it this, um, this some few days ago, and you're trying to get it out at your national dialogue. Tell us, uh, talk to us more about this, and how do you really want to get this class of Nigerians and this uh, sector of the economy into the fold? Uh, well, as uh, mentioned, uh, early in the morning you see these waste pickers mm -hmm. going around, picking plastics, um, all sort of metals, as you have said, yeah, the electronic gadgets all that are thrown away. Uh, so the sector is already in place, but mm -hmm. it's informal. They pick those items, they will take them to the collectors. So do they do it in an informal way. So when it is done like that, it impacts on the environment. It also affects the health 
of the workers. For instance, e-waste is highly hazardous. It contains a lot of heavy metals. So in the course of doing that, this can get into the food chain, affecting a lot of people, even the animals. And at the same time, some of these waste, they have a lot of valuables. For the e-waste, for instance, the amount of gold that is contained in this uh, gadgets is 100 uh, times more than what you get from the actual ore, gold, or gold, gold. Or when, when you mine it mm. before you extract the gold. Mm -hmm. so, and apart from gold, you have other metals, precious metals in these gadgets, especially these handsets we use and even the television sets. So there is need for all of this to be recovered and recycled. And one of our major problems is not well developed, this sector. So we don't have the technology to recover some of these uh, items. So what we do currently is to collect and uh, send it uh, abroad. We have some uh, so-called recyclers. So they do it in a <coughs> formal way. They can pieces it into different components so that we shift it out where some of this component will be uh, recovered. So one of the things we have put in place is to encourage all players in different sectors to come together to form their own PRO, mm. which is a third party organization that m will manage the issue of recycling, collection and recycling. So they will be responsible for funding the PRO, which is going to support all these aspects. And all this uh, is not targeted at profit making for now. The mm. PRO is not a profit making organization. Mm. It is just being put in place mm. in order to ensure that uh, uh, this waste emanating does not impact on the environment. So just uh, two days ago, we had an engagement with uh, various stakeholders mm. on this EPR uh, of FN, so just to encourage them to see how all of them can come on, come on board. Mm. We already have three sectors. And as m I've mentioned, very soon, those dealing with tires, already some people are recycling tires. They do what you call pyrolysis, they generate uh, some fuel. But uh, the way it is done, it impacts a lot on the environment. Likewise, the metallic sector is, being, uh, is coming up. So when it's formalized, it's going to be done in a sound environmental manner, and we get a lot of values from it. It generates employment. It's going to generate a lot of uh, wealth to those that are engaged in doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to also minimize the use of the raw materials, which is going to go a long way in uh, the sustainable use of the nation's natural resource. Because if you continue to just harvest what we have, or mine and use and dump, there will be a time where all these resources will be depleted. So in order to ensure the sustainable use of these materials, we have to go and look at the waste hierarchy. We have to reduce what we use. We have to reuse, we have to recycle. We also have to redesign for some of these items to ensure that you minimize the amount of material you use. So at the end of the day, what will come out as the waste will be minimal, which will also be recycled. So these are some of the things we have. Uh, Prof, I, I asked that, that question you know, specifically because I can see you know, that informal sector as a, a very huge investment for Nigerians, where you have Babambola, they call them, and you have them all over the place with heaps and heaps of uh, waste, solid waste, really. Do you really have, we're talking about roadmap now to effective waste management. Do you have any timeline for these uh, uh, PROs uh, towards forming associations and making this whole you know, business formal? Or how are you approaching it? I'm looking at it from the point of view of expediency. Yes, we have uh, timelines. Already uh, we have three PROs. So that, those that are already on board, so we have timelines. Those that are yet to come on board, you can, we cannot have a timeline for them. So most of, uh, for example, the Food and Beverages Recycling uh, Alliance, FIBRA, 
is one of the first PROs to come on board. So we have uh, already uh, given the timeline that the PIBRA and uh, the EPRON also. So presently, we are trying to see how we can go on enforcement. So this enforcement comes in different uh, ways. For instance, we are working with other agencies like Standard Organization of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We have the Rural Electrification Agency and uh, Nigerian Customs. So we want to see that we make the uh, subscription to these uh, PROs. Mm -hmm. As one of the requirements, they must register with the relevant PROs before they are allowed to engage in some of these businesses. For example, if you want to import some of these electronics, mm -hmm. you must go and register with the right PRO so that uh, you make provision for some money. So when you import these items at the end of their life, that money can be used mm -hmm. in taking care of the end of life product. Likewise, for the food, uh, for the battery sector also, we have had engagement with uh, relevant uh, agencies and uh, we, have, we are working assiduously to see that uh, we have some form of uh, compelling those involved into subscribing to EPR, which at the end of the day, they will fund, fund the PRO very well so that they take care of the end of life product, including the packaging. Mm. So okay. all this I'm is... I'm just wondering, you know, Prof, the, the, so we, we, we'll go on a short break. Not mm. uh, There's something that Prof mentioned. I mean, we'll get the other guests to also comment on it. So that it doesn't then, then become another avenue for taxation. If you say belong to a PRO and before you can be an importer, uh, you belong to a PRO and then you pay some money. Once that becomes a tax, the uh, importer will definitely pass it on uh, to, the to, to the consumer. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if, uh, well, of course, you can say the, the, the uh, importer has already paid up front. So if the importer between the end of life of that particular product and uh, when it is uh, called in uh, for, for recycling, the importer has already gone out of business, is liquidated, or otherwise, there will always be something. So I'm just wondering, because you have uh, too many uh, hidden taxes and levies in some locations, it can just become a disincentive. I hope we'll get into details of, uh, we'll get to understand going forward, uh, details of some of it. But the critical point, ultimately, will be the, the citizens and what their own responsibility will be and how aware they are of, uh, of what needs to be done. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation. All right, you're watching Good Morning Nigeria, still on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Let's bring in now to Shea Ugo of uh, the uh, Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling. Well, uh, the battery end of, uh, of products already has its own uh, alliance, as, as it were. But w the issue about bringing this to public attention, awareness, uh, and therefore action uh, to ensure that whatever forms of batteries that have uh, reached the end of their life, you know, get into uh, the uh, formal recycling arrangement. What is it that is being done? Or are you guys still in the boardroom, still talking and trying to see how you can get out into the public domain? Well, thank you very much. Um, for, for, for us as a PRO, we, we looked at the battery segment, the battery sector in segments. So we demarcated, we dis decentralized the whole system. We looked at the sectors that are producing the highest amounts of batteries in Nigeria. Are we looking at the small scale batteries, they call portable batteries. So these are batteries from laptops, from mobile phones, um, batteries for remote controls and things like that. Are we looking at batteries from the automotive sector, um, starter batteries from trailers, uh, 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 as we call it, um, tricycles, motor you know, uh, bikes, or are we looking at batteries from renewable energy, which is an emerging uh, growth sector right now for battery usage. In fact, it's the fastest growing sector right now for batteries, importing huge amount of batteries and deploying for uh, mini grid systems, solar home systems across the country. And of course, we're also looking at batteries from um, uh, so many other sectors, the banking sector, for example, um, batteries for backing up ATM machines and things like that, the telecom sector, batteries for their, for their uh, base stations spread all across Nigeria. You know, so when, when we looked at this whole sector, we even looked at the batteries from the generator sectors. Uh, a recent World Bank report stated that Nigeria has uh, uses about 17 million generators. Most of these generators also use batteries. This is a huge, huge amount of, of batteries that we're consuming in, in Nigeria. 
So after looking at these sectors, we decided to focus on the sectors that generate the highest amount of batteries, which are the automotive sector, uh, renewable energy sector, and then the telecoms sector. Of course, generator batteries are, are the same thing with automotive batteries. They're the same size and the same types of, of batteries. And then we're also looking at the different chemistries of these batteries. Are they lithium ion batteries or are they lead acid batteries? And which of them has the highest potential to pollute our environment? And which of them can be recycled locally? And which of them do we need to export out of the country? So right now for, for lead acid <coughs> batteries, we have some local recycling capacity. And we've been trying to grow this capacity, improve the technology that has been adopted for lead acid recycling in the country where lead is converted into, batteries are recycled into lead ingots, and these lead ingots are exported out of the country to battery manufacturing plants outside Nigeria. You know, so we're looking at the entire value chain, right from the consumer. Right now, like um, you mentioned earlier, uh, there's growing awareness on the value of batteries. So you will not find uh, automotive batteries or inverter batteries lying around because everybody knows that. When it gets to end of life, you just need to take it back to your dealer um, when you're going to purchase a new battery or you know you can hand it over to a registered battery collector around your neighborhood or around your city so that these batteries can be channeled towards the responsible uh, battery uh, you know management framework um, there are issues concerning the smaller scale batteries you know small but bat portable batteries used for remote controls and all that most of those batteries end up in our dump sites across nigeria this is very unfortunate because there's so much hazard and so much uh, acids getting into dump sites getting into our underwater you know underwater where we have you know we rely on boreholes a lot in nigeria so if for a country that relies so much on boreholes and then you are disposing so much <coughs> batteries in our dump sites and uh, point uh, acids uh, into the soil we're ending up you know polluting our water sources you know pollut polluting our drinking water so we've been trying to carry out some of this awareness you know to get the public to understand how this pollution from batteries can come around and hurt you even when you think uh, you know it, it's out of sight but when it's out of sight doesn't mean it's out of your way it will surely come back one way or the other, you know. So there's so much that has been done. Um, traditionally, uh, so much we are still waiting to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the way, sorry, I mean, you're saying traditionally, mm -hmm. after the death of Berek batteries in Nigeria, do we still have battery manufacturers in Nigeria? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, over the last uh, 20 years, due to policy issues, economic issues, sanctions, uh, most of the battery manufacturers uh, in Nigeria closed down. There were about 11 of them. Right now, we only have Ibeto. Uh, located at Inewi, Ibeto still manufactures uh, batteries, uh, even though at a very low scale because of um, the imports, the inflow of uh, uh, substandard batteries from Asia, from India, you know, they flood our markets and make it difficult for, for local battery manufacturers to thrive. But Ibeto has, has remained true to the game and has continued to produce batteries even though at a small scale. Uh, recently, there's been some inflow of some few battery, uh, battery assemblers. Um, I'm, uh, I'm aware that there are a few battery manufacturing interests trying to come into the country. And it's one of the things that we're trying to do as an alliance to ensure circular economy uh, in this sector. So if we're recycling batteries in Nigeria, Nigeria has become a huge producer of lead ingots, which, uh, which is 65% of what you need to manufacture a battery. But now we have the raw material because we're recycling battery, but we're exporting these raw materials out of the country and then importing batteries back to Nigeria. So if we're going to go to a circular economy and improve our economy, create jobs here, if we're recycling batteries now, then we should also encourage um, battery manufacturing so that all the batteries we use in the country go around the circle and end up as bat in, the, in the battery manufacturing plants here and channel back into the Nigerian economy so that the issues of exports uh, of our currency, you know, dollar exchange rates and things like that do not affect um, some of these products. So there's a lot of work uh, we're doing uh, in our discussions with um, the sector, in our discussions with uh, the government regulators, uh, Nesria especially, who has been quite supportive in developing the policies and regulations and then the enforcement mechanisms that we need to ensure that everybody complies to this issue. And finally, I was trying to mention something about, um, about waste management in general, and then of course, as it relates to, to batteries. Uh, waste management is a utility, um, just like a uh, water board, just like power. Uh, but waste management is the least collected uh, revenue uh, for, for environmental management in, in Nigeria. Traditionally, we have not paid households, companies, have paid very little for waste management, but we pay for water, we pay for electricity. And it's because we don't consider waste management so important. That's why we're always reluctant um, to pay uh, the waste tax. I think that um, when the awareness grows and uh, the issues of waste tax uh, is, is embedded in as part of a utility, 
that every organization, every household knows that as you pay your water bills, you pay your light bills, there's a waste tax that you must pay um, in managing the waste that you're generating in your homes or, or, or as an organization. <coughs> then, it, then it doesn't become a burden, but rather you see it as a service that you're you contributing to to ensure that the environment is protected. Well, I think uh, with this awareness. Call, what do you, uh, Nadabo, what do you call the uh, waste uh, fees that various households pay for their waste to be collected? In Lagos, for instance, I mean, you have all these PSPs mm -hmm. that go all over the place, and you are required to pay your levy. Mm -hmm. In some suburbs here in Abuja, you do that. So you are, are you advocating an additional tax on top of that? No, I'm not. Um, the so PSPs in Lagos are, are funded by the Lagos State Government. No, um, through how contracts. households pay? You pay. I can assure you, because I've consulted for, for, for LOMA in the past, I've consulted for Abuja Environmental Protection Board. For example, the Abuja Environmental Protection Board has laws um, that require that households and companies pay uh, fees for waste management, but th there's very little collection, let me put it like that. There's extremely little collection going on. People do not pay waste fees. It is just the way it has been for over the years in Nigeria. Um, companies who are supposed to build in environmental fees in their products hardly do that and hardly remit um, these fees to government. You mentioned earlier about um, increased uh, uh, fees on, on, on companies importing products and thereby transferring these fees to consumers. For the battery sector, for example, the recycling fees that we uh, charge for battery recycling it basically break down to the cost of logistics, of collection, transportation, and sometimes even exports of these uh, lithium-ion batteries that we cannot recycle locally. And these fees usually are something like 500 naira. So for a battery that costs uh, 25,000 naira, and we charge something of 500 naira, it is completely negligible. It is a fee that can be built into the cost of the product without increasing the price of these products. And that is where the SON, Consumer Protection, also come in to regulate the prices of our products to ensure that companies do not take undue advantage of the consumer because they have to pay uh, waste management fees. The same thing for the uh, food and beverage um, sector, for Coca-Cola and other companies producing plastic bottles. If you pay 50 cobble for a Coca-Cola bottle or a bottle of w bottled water that costs 100 naira or 150 naira and the recycling fee is 50 cobble or maybe one naira, that, uh, that would not require that the company should now increase the cost of their products. They need to redesign their product designs to include environmental costs, which usually are very little and do not necessarily have to impact on the cost of this product. So environmental, uh, the responsibility for environmental management is something that must be done. If we don't take this responsibility seriously or if, if we continue to uh, make excuses for, for, for not uh, charging environmental fees or, you know, or, or, or being sentimental to the companies mm -hmm. who are bringing this, uh, f these products into the country or manufacturing them, then we will never move forward from where we, you know, where we are right now to where we need to be as regards to uh, environmental management. Um, uh, really, Tessie, thank you so much for that elaborate explanation. Um, let's not forget about toxic waste in this discussion and, of course, uh, chemical waste. who will come to the probe from that and talk about it. Mm -hmm. But before we come to the probe, let me ask, uh, you know, uh, Abdullahi Rigasa mm -hmm. about the issue Tessie was, and that's talking about, uh, which, of course, Kingsley also, you know, commented on, talking about household waste mm -hmm. and how the education around this very uh, section of the waste management uh, in most urban areas or urban settlements, I would say, especially in Abuja and big cities, you know, this payment, PSP is being paid, at least people pay in order to get their waste evacuated and they may be uh, disposed of. Mm -hmm. But in the larger society, these things are missing, and of course, you, they are now left at the mercy of this, uh, you know, uh, waste collectors that go around houses, announcing their arrival, picking what they want to pick, trade by batter, and things like that. Um, how do we get this one formalized in such a way that at least uh, these ones have become now an avenue of getting <coughs> more wealth than just having waste around? Mm. Yeah, the reality is that the informal sector that you've seen operating, uh, these are the capacities that we have, you know, as a nation. So in formalizing them, we have to be very careful. Yes, we want to be like U.S., we want to be like Europe, but then if you look at our, the fundamentals in Nigeria, but over 70% of Nigerians are are poor, over 54 percent that I heard recently, are unemployed. And the waste management uh, space is where most of these uh, unemployed, you know, are readily uh, employed or get their subsistence. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also key, you know, in our national life. Yes, it would be beautiful if every household can afford to pay waste management charges. 
but um, it's not so because the, real, the reality is not so. It's not everybody that can even afford to pay for power, for water, let alone waste. So we must have uh, devised a mixture of clever ways of recovering value from the waste streams that are generated at household level. And that is to say that households should be encouraged to segregate because when you, when you sort waste at household level, you know, they acquire certain value right from that point in time. And that is the reason why you see people, uh, you know, moving, we call them itinerant buyers. Mm -hmm. Even though you see them in Abuja, they go to the bins. But in the slums, they move from house to house because they do recognize that no matter how poor you are, you have something of value in your waste stream that they can be able to buy. And when they we- They go by the name of uh, <laughs> fed by butter. You yes, uh, uh, yes. Sometimes they give money, sometimes they give other things mm -hmm. of, uh, of value. But the reality is that waste, even in the slums, they have certain value. So we need to combine the waste management strategies that, uh, as you mentioned, especially, you know, in high borough areas, people, uh, people living in GREs uh, and uh, affluent areas, those that can afford it. But then in slums where our, uh, most of our countrymen live, we need to, you know, imbibe the culture of resource recovery. Let people at that level sort their ways into different, you know, value chains. And then once you have the volume, you aggregate them, then somebody will now go, go and buy. That way we minimized, you know, the cost of waste management and we recover some value. So this quick, uh, this clever, that's how I call them, because in America or in Europe, you don't see these methodologies. Mm -hmm. But in Africa, we just have to do it because our people are not rich people. So we have to recover waste. We have to segregate them at source. We have to give them that value when they become aggregated. That is what is happening to the scrap metal value chain. You see a trailer mm -hmm. full of scrap metal. <coughs> that's worth about 20 to 30 million naira. Mm -hmm. But if you don't pick the waste, as you said, from kids, with magnet moving from, uh, you know, stream to stream, street to street, you will not be able to aggregate. So we need to promote this informality, but in a controlled manner, such that the government will be able to get something and the communities will also, you know, be able to get something back from the waste that they are generated. Okay. Uh, all, those, all those scrap metal dealers that you mentioned, some of them mm. have been uh, caught mm. uh, for uh, seeking to uh, merchandise, mm -hmm. vandalize the railway tracks. I mm -hmm. hope you are, you are aware of that. Yes. We have discussed that on Good Morning Nigeria. Mm -hmm. In fact, the MD of Nigeria Railway Corporation sat mm -hmm. exactly where you are sitting now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a few arrests, and mm -hmm. I think there have been some other convictions mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. around Plateau, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the Just High Court, mm -hmm. uh, the Plateau has State High Court has also uh, convicted them. And we do hope that when they form their PRO, mm -hmm. uh, there will be this uh, clear rules as yes. to what kind of, what is scrap metal yes. and what isn't uh, scrap metal. Yeah. One, one point that we haven't had enough time to deal with, mm -hmm. I know that the DG of Nesria has referenced that uh, a number of times, that's to say the food and beverage sector. Mm -hmm. The menace of plastic waste in our environment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how uh, I mean, there, are, there will be issues with uh, the proposal by uh, the Alliance for Responsible Battery Recycling, mm. get a new tax mm. in places where people are already paying uh, for, say, waste disposal and so on and so forth. But plastic waste management, th this is a cardinal focus mm. in some jurisdictions. Uh, this doesn't appear to be uh, a high point for us just yet. Mm. Is it? Yeah, uh, uh, you were very short. But then the EPR from Nestra is very key in the recovery and recycling of plastic waste because the producers are well known and the only way to capture them is under the EPR as uh, the DG rightly mentioned. So I believe that is the way forward. Charge Coca-Cola, charge Nestle uh, yeah. and other producers of uh, this plastic waste. Hey, well, is it charge? I mean, mm. uh, you yeah. see, we keep saying charge. Ch when we focus too much on money, <laughs> sometimes, I mean, we lose sight of the larger objective. It's a charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody, it's the same issue, if you recall, mm -hmm. that we had with oil and gas, mm -hmm. gas flaring. Mm -hmm. It said, look, there was a penalty, and the penalty was so paltry. Mm -hmm. They said, if you flare gas, you mm -hmm. pay so much. So mm -hmm. people, were, they, the producers were just flaring the gas. Mm -hmm. Actually, you cannot say it's not a charge. Mm -hmm. Those uh, responsible, they come together to form the PRO. Mm -hmm. So they sit down and look at it, decide on uh, what the, the fraction of uh, money to put so that they can take care of the... So we call it a fee. Yeah, a fee. Note. A mm. fee. Recycling mm. fee. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. So they agree. As mentioned by Tessie, he gave an example mm -hmm. of a bottle of uh, 
hundred naira bottle of drink. If you feed, if you put fifty kobo mm. as a recycling fee, it's negligible. It may not even change the cost of the item per se. We don't really have a time really to go further so much, but I won't. Uh, it won't be out of place, uh, Prof, for you to maybe comment at least uh, sixty seconds on, uh, you know, toxic waste and then chemical waste. Mm. Uh, issue of toxic waste is a serious issue, either toxic or you call it a hazardous waste. Mm. And uh, a lot of items are classified as uh, toxic or hazardous. For instance, uh, used tires is not allowed into Nigeria because it's considered as a hazardous waste. And we also have other chemicals that are known to be hazardous, even though they are very useful. They are needed by some industries. Mm. So as Nestle, as an agency, regulatory agency, we are mandated to ensure whatever that is coming into the country, if it's hazardous, we give out the import permit. And when it comes, we track even the transportation, the usage, and the final disposal. And if this chemical is going to be manufactured in Nigeria, we are also responsible for ensuring that it is done in a very safe environmental manner. So this is done to just to protect the environment and also to protect <coughs> those that are working either in the industry or those that will use uh, this uh, uh, chemical. And also Nigeria is a signatory to the Basel Convention, which uh, is talking about the transboundary movement of this hazardous waste. So it shouldn't just... How, how, how much contact has there been with the PROs in this sector? Uh, which sector? The hazardous waste sector. Well, we don't have a sector that we call hazardous waste. Yeah. I mean, put together, when you look at them, which one? I mean, how do you get across to them? I, don't they have a PRO? No, you can call, not call a PRO for hazardous waste. All these sectors they are, that they engage in manufacturing, they use one... Uh, chemical or another. So when they use any of these chemicals that are toxic, so when they are going to import, well, they have to follow all these laid down uh, you, guidelines. You, you, you know, the, uh, the other point, very briefly, mm. when some of these imported used tires are confiscated yeah. or drugs or fake products are confiscated, the regulatory agency, which is not necessary, often makes a bonfire of these items. Yeah. And you can see the plume of smoke mm -hmm. going into the air. Mm -hmm. And then you're asking yourself, OK, you are curing one ailment, and then <laughs> you are <laughs> creating many more uh, <laughs> ailments. You know, for the, sometimes I just wonder why mm -hmm. we can't, you know, you see, they, they invite the media, television mm -hmm. cameras and all. And then somebody goes, you know, and then... I mean, so many of them even would Absolutely, sticks. yeah, mm. with sticks in lice it up. They say, uh, yes, mm. up it goes in smoke. <laughs> but mm. I, I, I don't know. So what do we do about this? I, is, couldn't we have... I mean, Rigasa is laughing, but... <laughs> 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 what do we do to, to minimize the... You said ta 